Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Congresswoman Cheryl's Telephone Town Hall. This evening, our town hall is focused on the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and Pandemic Recovery. My name is Kelly Doucette, and I'm one of the Congresswoman's District Directors, along with Jill Hirsch, who is also on the line. While we're waiting for everyone to get on, I'm going to run through some of the logistical information for tonight's event. We will begin the town hall with opening remarks from the Congresswoman. After that, the Congresswoman will introduce her guests and pose a few pre-submitted questions to them to get tonight's discussion started. We received hundreds of great questions before the town hall even began, so thank you everyone who submitted questions. After this, we will open up the line for live questions. If you would like to ask a question, please press star three on your phone line at any time, and you will be connected with one of our staff members and then put in the queue to ask your question live. When you are given the opportunity to ask your question live, Jill will call on you. Please try to keep the question brief so that we can get to as many questions as possible in the time that we have together. If we do not get to your question today, you can email it to the Congresswoman by going to cheryl.house.gov backslash contact. Any questions you might have regarding unemployment or if you need assistance with a federal agency, please feel free to ask your question and your call will be promptly returned by one of our caseworkers who are also with us on the line tonight. You can also reach out to our office at 973-526-5668. And without further delay, I will pass this over to Congresswoman Cheryl. Thanks, Kelly. And hi, everyone. This is Congresswoman Mikey Cheryl. Uh, thanks for joining us all on tonight's Telephone Town Hall. I'm really grateful to be joined by two incredible guests this evening. Joining us from the Department of Transportation, we have Deputy Administrator of the Federal Railroad Administration and a native of Jerseyan, Amit Bose. We also uh, will have joining us Dr. Meg Fisher, a pediatric infectious disease expert and special advisor to NJ Department of Health. So thanks to both of them for being here with us tonight. We'll hear from both of them in a moment, but first I want to start by highlighting some big news for the district that I'm sure you are all aware of. I'm thrilled to be able to say that last week the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act was signed into law. This law is really a culmination of years of work and advocacy, and I was honored to be able to join the signing ceremony at the White House with both Republican and Democratic colleagues to witness it being signed into law. I think you all know how focused I've been on getting the Gateway Tunnel funded and bringing infrastructure dollars back here to New Jersey, because many of you have been in this fight with me every step of the way. Since becoming your Congresswoman and hearing from all of you in forums like tonight, uh, it's only strengthened my focus on delivering for New Jerseyans across our district to help lower the cost of living, improve the quality of life, and strengthen our communities. That's included fighting to complete the Gateway Tunnel Project, pushing to lower prescription drug costs, and fighting to fix the harmful double tax imposed by the state and local tax deduction cap. I'm proud to say with the bipartisan infrastructure bill being signed into law, we've delivered uh, the final funding piece for Gateway. So with the House passage of the other piece of this puzzle, we're one step closer to delivering salt relief for nearly every single family in our district and will have lowered those prescription drug prices like insulin, which this bill ensures does not cost anyone more than $35 a month. There's still a few steps to go in getting the reconciliation bill across the finish line. And once we have a final bill through the House and Senate, we'll have time to discuss the provisions at a future town hall. For tonight, however, I want to take advantage of our amazing guests and focus on the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which we just signed into law. It's really tough to understate how crucial this infrastructure bill is going to be for our state and communities here in the district, especially as a result of the funding for the Gateway Tunnel Project and other rail investments like the Lackawanna Cutoff. The Gateway Tunnel Project is the most significant infrastructure investment in the bill, and North Jersey will benefit more from this bill than any other region in the nation. I'll get into more detail about these important provisions of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act in a bit with the Deputy Administrator. But while I tend to focus on rail, there are many other important programs in this bill that will address challenges we all face here in northern New Jersey. Unfortunately, I imagine everyone on this call has had recent experiences with long-term power outages. I know I have. I have four kids, and I specifically remember at Superstorm Sandy, I just made a huge Costco run before the power went out. And it still makes me sick to think of all the food I was throwing away after it spoiled. On top of that, it was incredibly stressful. I um, 
was, you know, I had a very young child at the time. She was only several months old. So trying to keep her warm during the power outage in November was really tough. Recently, there's not a year that goes by does not experience a week or more of power outages, whether it's from ice storms, hurricanes, or flooding, from Ogdensburg to Wayne to Montclair. I'm happy to say that this bill includes funding for grid resiliency that will be coming to New Jersey to address these issues. Many of our innovative towns in New Jersey 11 are already implementing EV charging stations locally because residents need them. I just got a tutorial recently the other day in Madison. This bill is going to help develop an EV charging station network across the country. From addressing Superfund site cleanup, bolstering flood resiliency, to removing PFAS and lead from drinking water, this bill has so many key components that will strengthen our communities and lower our costs. There are issues that not only address quality of life, but cost of living issues that are so important to New Jersey families. Fixing our roads, tunnels, and bridges will reduce travel and congestion costs. Expanding broadband will lower the cost of high-speed internet for 1.6 million New Jerseyans. Investments in the power grid will lower the cost of reliable electricity, and financial assistance to our towns for water infrastructure will reduce the need for property tax increases down the road. There's a reason that every single member of the New Jersey delegation, Democrat and Republican alike, voted for this bill. It's simple, really. It has significant economic health and environmental benefits for the people of New Jersey. We've received so many great questions about what these bills will mean for our community, so I want to hold a town hall to help answer them. So as I mentioned, to help me do that, I'm joined by two amazing guests, and I'd like to properly introduce them now. The first guest is Deputy Administrator of the Federal Railroad Administration, Amit Bose. Before he was appointed to this position this year, the Deputy Administrator served as Board Chair of the Coalition for the Northeast Corridor and on the New Jersey Restart and Recovery Advisory Council, as well as working with the New Jersey Transit and the New Jersey Department of Transportation. His experience working on transportation issues both federally and at the state level here in New Jersey make him a fantastic guest to have on our town hall tonight to help answer questions about what the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act will mean for your family and for New Jersey. And as we frequently had on these town halls throughout the pandemic, we're joined by an incredible medical expert. Over the past few weeks, my office has received a lot of questions about young children becoming eligible for the vaccine and booster shots, which were approved for all adults by the CDC last week. That's why I'm thrilled to have Dr. Meg Fisher with us tonight. She's a pediatrician who specializes in infectious diseases and serves as a special advisor to the New Jersey Department of Health Commissioner. Thank you, Deputy Administrator and Dr. Fisher for joining us. One last thing before we jump into questions, I wanna quickly thank everyone who participated in our Thanksgiving thank yous for New Jersey 11 Veterans Program, which I launched on Veterans Day to show our appreciation for those in our community who served in our armed forces. We've received thousands of cards, many from New Jersey 11 students. My team is distributing them to vets across the district for Thanksgiving, and I've really been humbled by the outpouring of thanks to our veterans. With that, I'd like to get to questions. We had quite a few pre-submitted for tonight's town hall, so I'll start by asking each one of our guests one of the pre-submitted questions. If you have questions, you can dial star three on your keypad at any time to be connected with someone, and you'll be placed in the queue to ask your question live. So first, Dr. Fisher, thank you and welcome, and I want to start with you. As we kick off this evening, thank you. Can you you give us a quick update on the current status of COVID numbers, hospitalizations, and transmission rates for New Jersey and especially northern New Jersey? Thanks again. Sure, and unfortunately, the numbers are not as uh, good as I would like them to be. Over the last week, we have seen uh, consistent increases in the number of cases, As you probably know, by uh, yesterday, we had over a million confirmed uh, cases. We've had uh, 95,503 confirmed hospitalizations and 25,442 confirmed deaths. These are uh, spread throughout New Jersey, um, but in uh, Bergen and Essex, uh, we really, as far as North New Jersey, those are certainly the places with the most uh, confirmed cases about 100,000 in each county, and uh, hospitalizations, about 9,000 in each county, and um, close to 3,000 deaths in each county. So that's, uh, that's where we are as far as the overall numbers, um, and I think what it tells us is we really want to get um, 
people who haven't yet been vaccinated, vaccinated, but we also know that we need to get uh, people boosters. So everyone over 18 is now eligible for a booster, and what we would really like is to uh, get more people boosted and to get our children vaccinated. Well, thanks so much. Um, and we have some recent updates on vaccine approvals. Can you talk about the current CDC guidelines for children and for booster shots for adults in particular? I know folks can go to the New Jersey Vaccine Appointment Finder at covid19.nj.gov to find out where they are available near them. Is that the best centralized source? That is uh, by far the best source. Um, and you just go there, you click on the vaccine finder. There's also our, um, our, our number, there's a hotline number, which of course I don't have with me at this second, um, but I will, uh, I will find it uh, while you're talking to a different guest and I'll have it as soon as oh, you uh, come and back we'll to me for the next question. Well. But let me we'll tell you about the uh, vaccines for children. So in uh, May, on May 10th, um, the FDA approved the emergency use authorization for Pfizer vaccines for children from uh, 12 to, 7, to uh, 15. So that allowed us to start getting adolescents vaccinated. And then just on October uh, 29th, the FDA approved the um, authorization down to age five. So we now have vaccines for everyone from uh, five and up. The dose for children 5 to 11 is a third of the dose that we give to um, the older adolescents and the adults. It seems to be very good at, uh, at, at teaching their immune systems how to fight off this virus. And we know that it's very important to get children immunized. Right now, children account for somewhere between 25 and 35 percent of the new cases of COVID-19. While most of them aren't getting very sick, some of them do get very sick, and some of them get complications of COVID. We know we've had more than 900 deaths among children in the U.S. due to COVID-19, which makes it a major uh, problem for our children. We also know there's long COVID and any number of other problems uh, related to this virus. So we have the tools now. The best tool that we have is vaccination. But we also don't want to give up our other tools, and those are the masks, and keeping that physical distance, keeping six feet away from others as much as possible, and, of course, washing your hands and staying home when you're sick. Thanks. Thanks so much, Dr. Fisher. That's all incredibly helpful information. Um, so now I'm going to turn to our Deputy Administrator. Thank you again for joining us this evening. With your background with FRA at the Department of Transportation and your experience with NJ Transit and focusing on the Northeast Rail Corridor, I could not think of a more perfect guest to join us tonight and discuss what this bipartisan infrastructure package means for North Jersey and the entire country. So, no surprise, I'd like to say, at a recent roundtable I held at the historic Madison train station with local officials, commuters, residents, and small business owners, we talked about the contrast of the heyday of the new rail system that really sparked the growth and industry in so many towns in this area a century ago. And then the impact, again, of the commuter rail system when it came in later um, on property values, uh, property values in Madison rose 50%. And as one of my mayors reminisced, he knew that when the clock struck 6.05 p.m., his dad was going to walk in the door. I wish we could still set our clock by the New Jersey transit trains. Unfortunately, because of the tunnel, that has not been the case for many years now. That's a big contrast with what our current commuters are experiencing. At that round table, I heard from commuters like Brian from Chatham who told us about how he stopped scheduling morning meetings altogether and stopped coaching his children's sports teams because of how often his trains to and from work were delayed or canceled. Can you talk about what the Gateway Tunnel Project would really mean for local commuters like Brian and why it's so important? Thanks for the question, Congresswoman, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to join you uh, this evening. I, I want to start off by really sincerely thanking you uh, for your support of the bipartisan infrastructure law now and, um, and, and what um, uh, a difference it's going to make in, in the lives of New Jerseyans and, and people uh, across the country. 
Um, I'm thrilled and, and honored to be a part of the Federal Railroad Administration at a time when we are going to have an unprecedented focus uh, and a historic focus on, on rail uh, going forward. Again, thanks to uh, your efforts. Um, when I uh, and, and President Biden came in in January, and, and even before January, President Biden knew uh, the Gateway Tunnel uh, very well. He uh, charged us uh, at the Department of Transportation, including Secretary uh, Pete Buttigieg, me, uh, the Federal Transit Administrator, Nuria Fernandez, to really focus on the tunnel. So there were some things leading to the bill that we did um, in um, a very uh, quick and efficient manner because we knew we had to position the tunnel in a good place um, when the American Jobs Plan, you know, now the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, came together. Um, so we completed the environmental process um, at the end of May, uh, which was um, a record time in, in when you're talking about the scope of the project uh, that we're talking about with the tunnel. Um, also, the tunnel partners came together and submitted a financial plan uh, for a Federal Transit Administration grant uh, to pay for um, a significant part of the project uh, they submitted that at the end of August. So um, we're in a situation right now where not only the federal government is there to partner uh, with New Jersey and other project partners like Amtrak and the Port Authority, but also um, having the state and, and state partners uh, on board to do their part now that the federal government is doing our part. So when it comes to the tunnel project and, and what it means for your constituents and, and New Jersey, um, we have to keep in mind that the 2012 um, Superstorm Sandy had um, a, a very um, 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 harmful impact on the tunnel. Um, we um, um, saw widespread damages, and, and while um, it's safe for train operations, we knew that frequent planned and unplanned maintenance or repair activities, which routinely disrupts the, your daily lives, uh, like of the gentleman that you just talked about, um, is, is uh, really affects uh, families um, at the end of the day. So we knew we had to repair it. Um, we know that if the existing tunnel were to close for an emergency long-term situation, it would have a large impact on the regional and national economy. Some studies have shown that the national economy could be damaged over $16 billion over four years if the tunnel were out of service for an extended period of time. Um, also, half of that cost would come from the time lost by workers who are unable to commute. Um, and also, it affects, it would affect Amtrak riders up and down uh, the Northeast Corridor. FRA right now is supporting the efforts of Amtrak to design and immediately implement a repair program that can ensure the continued safe and reliable service uh, in the existing tunnel. Um, and also, when it comes to the Hudson Tunnel project, it's going to include a long-term rehabilitation of the existing tunnel, which is needed to support significant uh, growth in ridership and also from the region in the next decade. Now, on top of that, the project includes construction of a new tunnel. So what I was just talking about was the repairs to the existing tunnel, but on top of that, this project is also about a new tunnel. Um, so that when the existing tunnel is undergoing the rehab, this new tunnel will be in existence and will be in use uh, for riders. 
Um, once the project is complete, we're talking about doubling the track capacity under the Hudson River. And that is also going to complement all the other projects that are part of the gateway program to increase the capacity of the rail infrastructure in the region. You were um, uh, instrumental in making sure the portal bridge um, got under construction, which it is now. And President Biden was um, um, lucky uh, to be at the groundbreaking for that at the end of October. Um, so we're seeing all these different pieces uh, come together uh, one by one. Uh, but I have no doubt that what we're doing right now, I mentioned that the tunnel's over 100 years old. What we're really doing now is, is about the next 100 years and beyond uh, for the region. Well, thank you. For that. And I really appreciate that explanation. And you, you sort of alluded to some of the questions I have about what the construction process and timeline will look like. I, I know many of us have seen reports that shovels will be in the ground starting in 2023. As you can imagine, um, I know Senator Schumer and I would like to move that timeline up uh, as soon as possible. Can you elaborate on this a little bit, what you kind of see as the timeline for this project? Yes, um, I can. So um, some of our information I'll, I'll premise by saying is from the Gateway Project Partners. Uh, that I have mentioned, and that includes the Gateway Development Commission, the states of New Jersey and New York, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, New Jersey Transit, and Amtrak. They are talking about um, construction starting in 2023, and they are talking about um, the construction uh, being in the range of uh, eight to 10 years. And um, what that construction entails, like I said, is a new tunnel as well as rehab of the existing tunnel. Um, that time frame that I mentioned is absolutely dependent on uh, numerous items, and one of which is obtaining federal funding for the project. And uh, you have been a champion uh, for the project in making sure that the federal funding is in place. Um, so what we're trying to do right now is make sure that that funding piece is buttoned up uh, so that construction can get underway. Now, um, the project partners uh, for years have been working on uh, engineering plans, uh, engineering design uh, for the project. Uh, as well as being ready for pre-construction activities, um, which can uh, start. And, and those are things uh, like utility um, um, relocation, as an example, and, and other things of that nature. So I know the project partners um, understand how um, important it is to get this project underway and I know um, they're aiming uh, to do it as quickly as possible. My colleagues at the Federal Transit Administration are currently reviewing uh, that uh, application that I mentioned for uh, grant funding that would um, constitute a large chunk of the federal funding. Um, in addition, the additional funding in the bipartisan infrastructure law um, includes significant new funding for the Federal Transit Administration and the Federal uh, Railroad Administration, some of which this project uh, would be eligible for. Um, ultimately, the Department of Transportation is continuing to work closely with the Gateway Project partners to advance uh, the tunnel, and there are remaining um, requirements uh, that we need uh, the project partners to meet before the construction um, can um, the construction funding can be awarded. But I know um, that the relationship between the Department of Transportation and the Commission and the other project partners is a strong one, and um, those project partners are providing us information in a timely manner, and, and we hope that continues. 
Yes, thank you. And if it doesn't continue, please let me know because I will certainly be happy to get engaged. Um, I also, you know, eight to 10 years sounds a bit daunting to many people. I know I've had the comment from some of my constituents, I, you know, I'm going to be retired by that time, you know. So can you, it's my understanding that actually people will see some relief uh, for in their commute even before the entire project is finished. Is that right? Well, yes. And, and, and that relief, what we're trying to do um, in terms of that relief is make sure that the current uh, tunnel uh, is, is, is in a condition where there are not power outages or, or other situations that have happened uh, over the years uh, so that the commuters can rely on the tunnel and, and the service is a good one. Um, and, and that's where also, Congresswoman, these other projects that are a part of the Gateway Program, like the Portal Bridge, um, are, are so important um, and, and, and need to continue, and we need to deliver uh, those as well. So um, we want to make sure that the service that's there right now, um, from trains not breaking down, uh, like I said, from power um, being available, that those things are, are there on a continuous basis. And this funding will help Amtrak, will help New Jersey Transit um, to make sure that, that the current tunnel uh, continues to serve um, the commuters and, and the railroad passengers that use it. We are looking forward to that here, I can tell you. Um, and shifting gears a little bit and building off of your experience at the NEC, Another project that I've been working on throughout my time in office is the Lackawanna Cutoff, which would provide an option into the city for those in Western Morris County and Sussex County and really alleviate the traffic congestion along Route 80, which is a heavily traveled road in NJ11. We received a question from Michael in Morristown asking, what are the plans for the Lackawanna Cutoff? I know this line was in the initial plans released by Amtrak for the funding from this bill, uh, do you know anything more about the potential timeline here? Uh, yes, Congresswoman. So um, the the project um, um, dimensions that that I'm aware of would be from Scranton uh, going through New Jersey and and going into uh, New York City. Um, I've heard from the Pennsylvania Northeast Regional Railroad Authority. Um, I've also talked to Amtrak uh, about that project, uh, as well as talked to uh, New Jersey Transit about it. Uh, I know you know that New Jersey Transit actually is doing uh, some uh, aspects of the overall project right now uh, that are in the New Jersey uh, portion to advance that while the other pieces come together. Um, so we're very interested in that project and trying to make sure we do our part uh, to advance uh, things. And, um, and again, this is a, 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 an example, an illustration of something that had really not been uh, thought to be possible um, before the bipartisan infrastructure law and now is very much in the realm of possibility. And that means um, all the, similar to all the work that's already gone into the Hudson Tunnel, some of those um, preliminary steps and, and ongoing steps, um, uh, the, the project um, uh, sponsors and supporters need to take some of those steps uh, regarding the Lackawanna cutoff, uh, because it is, still in the early developmental stages, but we're definitely looking forward to the uh, continued development of the project and working with the regional partners so it can go forward. Well, that is some more great news. So and now I'm going to um, turn things over to Jill Hirsch, my other district director. So if you have questions, you can dial star three on your keyboard at any time to be connected with someone on my staff, and you'll be placed in the queue to ask your question live. Jill? Thanks, Congresswoman. Before we turn to live questions, I wanted to ask you one of the biggest 
uh, recurring questions we received from our questions. Many constituents were concerned about the spending in these bills and how they will be paid for. That is a great question um, because in the past, New Jersey families are often the ones footing the bill for our national investment. So we need to make sure um, that we're thinking critically about how we're investing in our infrastructure so that uh, we are spending taxpayer dollars wisely. And certainly I think the reason you see um, so much bipartisan support, you know, every single person in the New Jersey delegation voted for this piece of legislation. We had Senator Portman, the former budget director, uh, Republican senator who spoke about the importance of this legislation and called it a counterinflationary measure uh, at the signing ceremony because this is a huge investment in our economy and our economic future. It's going to uh, actually invest in uh, bringing costs down for commuters. As we have people getting back on rail, it's going to be an important investment in the future of our climate because we know our biggest uh, carbon emitters are our cars. And it's not just a spending plan for next year. This is, the, this is how we're spending on infrastructure over the next 10 years. And it is going to really keep our nation competitive with the rest of the world. So this will be the first time in 20 years that we have outspent China on infrastructure. And like I said, these investments are investments in the economy of, New, of northern New Jersey, and nobody has benefited more from this piece of legislation than our region with the Gateway Tunnel Project. Uh, that is just one piece of the legislation. The other piece of the legislation also attacks affordability for New Jerseyans. So, the next piece of legislation we're working on right now, and we've already passed through the House, includes a uh, uh, salt fix for families here in New Jersey, so raising the cap, and also bringing down costs for working parents by addressing the child care, uh, the cost of child care, and also a tax cut for working families, uh, working parents and for middle class families. So these are critical investments we're making in the economy of our state to grow our economy and remain competitive. Um, and we got great news from the Congressional Budget Office, a nonpartisan budget office, which has uh, that this will not add uh, to the deficit. Um, they had some money that they said would be uh, a spend, but then that is countered by investment in the IRS, and that enforcement action is not budgeted by the CBO, but uh, experts on both sides of that have said that will actually be a pay for. So this is a benefit to the economy of the United States. Jill? Great. Thank you, Congresswoman. We're now going to go to some live questions. Our first question is from Dr. Donnelly in Rockaway. He has a question about accessibility. Good evening, Congresswoman uh, Cheryl. Uh, first, hi. Th hi. First, uh, thanks for all you're doing to support uh, us New Jerseyans. And uh, I have a question regarding transportation. I hear a lot of questions here about uh, or information around trains. I'm looking more at the buses. Um, I am a uh, professor at Montclair State University, and uh, I use New Jersey Transit Access Link as a uh, blind passenger. Um, my 40-minute transportation from Rockaway to Montclair should take about 40 minutes. Consistently, it's been taking about three hours each way. The other day, it took four and a half hours to get home from work, and the, you know, just the delay and the wait has been um, quite stressful, and I'm hoping something can be done to diminish this. They have minimal number of uh, drivers, so they're all everybody's stressed in different directions, but certainly puts a lot of pressure on the um, passenger who's, who needs this service, does not have any other options, and uh, trying to hopefully find their way to work and back home in a reasonable period of time. That's a great question, and over the years, um, we've heard concerns about New Jersey Access Link and the reliability of it and what an impact that makes on people who do rely on that form of transportation. But it sounds, from what you're reporting, as if it's gotten even worse. 
uh, and some of this uh, is, is likely related to workforce issues. I know we've had driver issues. Um, the legislation that we're putting forth invests in training and different programs to get our critical workforce uh, back to work and invest in child care. That's been a huge issue. One of the largest groups of people that have not returned to the workforce are our working parents. So making sure that they have access to affordable child care so they can get back to work is going to be important. But specifically related um, to access link, New Jersey Transit is getting $4.1 billion under the bipartisan bill. So I'm happy to reach out to them specifically and ask what they're planning to do to address problems at New Jersey Access Link. Crucially, uh, not for Access Link necessarily, but for other options such as rail. The bill also includes $1.7 million for ADA compliance of stations, which is going to make a huge difference for people. Um, I was also talking uh, to one rail expert and maybe Deputy Administrator, you have this, but about how um, ensuring that people can get on and off the train more easily. Um, that it is more accessible, actually speeds up train times. Is not simply people that um, have ADA concerns, but other passengers uh, ingress and egress more quickly to keep the trains on time. So it's a benefit for everyone. But I'm going to turn it over um, to our deputy administrator to see um, if there's any more information you have on the core issues that we're, we're trying to address with this new law and specifically issues related to accessibility and people um, relying on some of these access links that we have where the train doesn't go or some of our bus routes don't go. Uh, yes, Congresswoman. Um, in, in terms of rail, the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, gives uh, new uh, funding opportunities to improve um, Americans with Disability Act uh, access, uh, especially at train stations and, and on trains. Uh, we have money in the bill now for Amtrak uh, to make those improvements at its stations um, uh, across the, the country. And what it also means for stations and, and transit agencies, as well as Amtrak, is we have um, a number of programs now where uh, they didn't have funding, um, access to funding, but now with the bill, they will have access to funding to make these improvements. Um, but it's not only about just access to, to the funding, it's also making sure that we deliver those uh, projects on time and on budget. Um, and, and, and like I just said, you know, in a timely manner is, is really, really important. Um, I, I wasn't aware of the um, issues related to, to buses that, um, that we just um, heard about, but um, I know that, and I will share that with the Federal uh, Transit Administration uh, so that they're um, aware of it and, and the impacts that that is having on people who uh, rely on that and, and really have no other um, alternatives or options and, and how important it is to um, provide that, that service. Um, and, and, and also, um, you know, when FTA um, um, receives or, or, or provides or, or provides opportunities to, to funding through its programs, um, th that does um, have a bus component to it, too. And I know that the Federal Transit Administration, just like the uh, Federal Railroad Administration, um, the, the President Biden has talked about equity um, very passionately. And in transportation, uh, we need to make sure that people um, have not only access but are getting quality uh, services, and that means that uh, buses, trains um, are running on time and that there's proper access uh, as well. I would really appreciate you passing that on, and I'll do the same because um, Access Link is something that we've heard about from our community members, like I said, even before COVID. Um, and, and to imagine having a three hour commute from 40 minutes away is, is really tough to think about, you know, how that impacts a person's life. I will get, like I said, um, 
to our caller, I'm going to get in touch with New Jersey Transit to make sure they're taking this into account with the uh, over $4 billion that they're getting from the federal government. Because um, if, and, and the reason I think it would be great if you could convey this is we have problems here in New Jersey, the most densely populated state in the nation with a lot of public transportation. So I shudder to think what this might look like in other parts of the country. But thank you so much for that. Um, I do appreciate it. So uh, once again, I will kick it over to Jill for our next question. Thank you, Congresswoman. Our next question comes from Kate in Morris County regarding boosters. Kate, you're on the line. Oh, perfect. Hello, Congresswoman Cheryl. Um, It's a pleasure to speak with you again. Um, My question is how different are the boosters from adults to children? How effective will they be? Well, thanks, Kate. That is a great question because I have um, two two of my four children are between the ages of five and 12. So I want to know the answer to this as well, because um, (laughs) they, uh, I, I'll be frank with you. I was going to go today, but ran out of time. So we will be going as soon as possible to get the two of them vaccinated. And I'm curious about the answer as well. So I'm going to turn this one over to Dr. Fisher. Thank you so much. Um, for the boosters, the, you have three choices of a vaccine that you can get as a booster. You can get the J&J, you can get the Pfizer, or you can get the Moderna. Now, who should get boosters? So boosters, everyone who's um, over 18, 18 and older, is uh, eligible for a booster provided it's a certain amount of time from your other doses. So if you got J&J to start with, if you got one dose of J&J, two months later, you are eligible, and in fact, we recommend that you get a booster. If you got um, either Pfizer or Moderna, it, it will be six months after your second dose. You are then eligible for the booster, again, as long as you are 18 years and older. And of course, we know that this is most important for um, people over 50 and people who live in long-term care. But we would like everybody to get the booster because we really want to stop this uptick of disease, and we think the best way to do that is through the boosters. Now, as far as children go, we don't yet have any vaccine that's authorized as a booster for children. And remember, they just started getting getting vaccinated Uh, For the uh, 12 to 15, they just started in May, and um, the 2 to 11 just started uh, at the end of October. So we have a little time uh, before they will be eligible for a booster, and we don't know whether they'll need a booster or not because uh, the children are having a very um, robust response, and it's possible they may not need it. One more thing about the boosters. Uh, For the J&J booster, you get exactly the same uh, vaccine as you got for the first dose. For the Pfizer, again, same uh, vaccine that you got for the first two doses. But for Moderna, the booster is a half dose. So if you got two Pfizers, you can either get a third Pfizer, a half dose Moderna, or a J&J. So that's up to you. It's your choice. It allows you that that, uh, ability to mix and match if you think that that would be uh, better off. Um, or you can stay with the vaccine that you've already gotten. The other thing people wonder is, are the reactions to the boosters just as bad as they were to the first two shots or the same as the first two shots? And for many people, what we've seen is that they have less reactions to the boosters, but some people do have the same type of reaction uh, to the booster that they had with the first two. Remember, these are mostly mild uh, reactions, and they're almost always gone within 24 to 48 hours. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. And Dr. Fisher, do you know anything about the efficacy of the children's vaccines? It sounds like you had alluded to the fact they might even um, have better effects on those vaccines on children than on adults. Do you know anything about that? Sure. So they haven't been around quite as long, so we don't know for sure how long the effectiveness is going to last, but we know that Two weeks after you finish your course, so your course is the two shots, two weeks after that, you are more than 90% uh, protected from from infection. Well, thank you so much. That is, again, great news. Um, Jill, you want to go on to the next question? 
I do. I just want to make sure that everybody knows you can dial star three on your keypad at any time to be connected with someone on our staff, and you'll be able to get in line to ask a question live. Um, right now, we have a question from Allison in Sparta regarding gas prices. Allison, you're on the line. Hello, um, Senator Sh uh, Sherry. You are amazing, I have to say. Um, I just pulled out, uh, I'm sorry, Congresswoman, I apologize. Um, <laughs> I just pulled out my winter coat, and for the first time, I've been trying to wear sweaters, and my question to you is this. Um, gas prices. We live in a very cold area, and um, I know that President Biden has just pulled out some of the reserve. Will we be seeing any lowering gas prices while we start, you know, um, putting on the heat in our that, homes? Yes, yes, and I was freezing today for the first time of the year. Um, so I hear you, and that has been a uh, you know, a, a critical issue as we've seen gas prices rising uh, here and across the country. As you may have been hearing, this is a global supply issue. Quite frankly, demand has come back. And OPEC, who is a, that's like a cabal of gas producing nations, has intentionally withheld supply so that the global price has gone up. Um, President Biden, along with um, five other countries that have, a, they've agreed to tap into the strategic petroleum oil reserve. In other words, put, um, put that into the market so that we can lower costs. And we hope to see with those uh, five other nations and putting more supply into the market, we hope to be able to address the increased costs. Um, he's just announced that, so I'm hoping that we'll see results from that. Um, I. You know, I also, you know, we've also increased here in the United States. We've doubled the number of crude oil rigs since last year. So we have upped production as well. So not just uh, increasing supply from our reserves, but also increasing supply from production. So we are producing more. So hopefully we will start to see those prices go down over the next couple months. And I, yes, I hear you. I'm hearing from many constituents, not just about their heating oil, but also the prices at the pump. So we're working hard to get those prices down. And thanks for the question. Congresswoman, we had a number of questions regarding salt. Stephen from Morris Township asks, you voted for H.R. 5376, the Build Back Better Act, with a salt deduction, but it's likely to get cut in the Senate. What's your next step to prevent this unfair double taxation from continuing to hurt middle class families in your district? Well, I, I was beginning to wonder if I was really on a District 11 town hall because I hadn't yet received a salt question. Um, thing that I have been incredibly focused on really since the minute the double taxation was posed upon us um, in the last administration. As many of you may know, we have never had a cap on the state and local tax deduction in the history of our entire tax code. Because as everyone here in New Jersey knows, this is not untaxed income. This is income that's been taxed by our state and put towards issues that are important to our state, which is really important because we just don't get the money back from the federal government that we put in. So we are one of the two states, New York and New Jersey, we always kind of vie for this title, unfortunately that give more to the federal government and, and get back um, the least from the federal government for our investment. So it's really important to address this issue, which is why I and several other members of Congress have simply stated that we will not vote for any bill that doesn't include um, fixing the state and local tax deduction cap. And uh, we have passed several measures through the House, in fact, in the last Congress, three, um, we've passed this measure through the House. We've negotiated it um, and increased the cap and have sent it over to the Senate. So as, you, as the, the writer correctly mentioned, it is in the House version of the bill. Um, but as was also correctly mentioned, the Senate, especially uh, Senator Sanders, has continued to attempt to strip salt out of the measures. And we have said in no uncertain terms, we're simply not voting for a piece of legislation that does not include a salt fix. 
So we've passed it over to the Senate. If the Senate changes our bill, and we have every reason to believe they will change several things about our House bill, in order for it to pass, we need to vote on it again in the House of Representatives. And um, they simply do not have the votes because of, quite frankly, myself, Josh Gottheimer, Tom Swazi, and several others. They don't have the votes to pass a piece of legislation without the salt fix. So um, whatever they do in the Senate, uh, they can't get back through the House unless they address this. So that's how we intend to keep that in the final piece of legislation that's sent over to the president. Thank you, Congresswoman. Next, we have a question from Tom in Persephone regarding COVID, um, a question about COVID treatment. Tom, you're live. Uh, yes. Uh, hi, Congresswoman. This is Tom Davis. And I'm just, I just, my hi. question is, we hear so much about vaccines and, and yet yeah, they're very important. You know, like I've said before, everyone in my family is, is vaccinated, but there are people out there who are not vaccinated and there are people out there who are getting sick, even though they are vaccinated. Are we focusing on treatments as well? Because the only thing I'm hearing about is vaccine, 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 and nothing about treatment. Um, that's a great question. Um, because uh, as you know, we have focused on vaccines and I do just want to mention that again, if you need an appointment finder for a vaccine, you can find it at um, covid19.nj.gov and there is an information hub that you can go to for that. But you're right, there are new treatments out there which we have been focused on. As you may know, uh, some of our great pharmaceutical companies right here in North Jersey have been working on uh, these types of treatment and they have developed uh, several. Um, something that I think of in layman's terms, and this is not the uh, scientific label, but it's sort of a Tamiflu type situation for COVID. So that if you get diagnosed early and take the treatment early, um, it really does work very well on COVID. So we've, we've, our pharmaceutical companies have been working on that, and now um, we're getting it um, approved and getting that out to our hospitals because that, that too, you know, we need to attack this at every level get people vaccinated to protect them. And many of the cases that are break, what we call breakthrough cases, cases that where people are vaccinated but still get COVID are far milder than anything we have seen uh, with people who are not vaccinated. Um, and then, so get everyone vaccinated, but then have the treatment options for those that do, do get COVID and get affected by it. Great question. Uh, if I can um, add, in addition to those uh, oral antivirals, which we really uh, hope will um, get approved before the end of the year, uh, there are also the monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and if you get the monoclonal antibodies soon after your symptoms, they will uh, generally keep you out of the hospital. So uh, good news there. And then if you are sick enough to be in the hospital, uh, we do know a lot better about uh, treating people now. We have uh, one antiviral, remdesivir, which has uh, certainly has some activity, but we also know better how to use corticosteroids and how to provide assisted ventilation for people who do get into trouble. So I think we're a lot better at managing uh, COVID, but of course, it's always better to try to prevent it. And I did uh, look up that phone number. If you don't like computers, here's the phone number to dial, 8 Five 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 six eight zero five four five. One more time, eight five 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 six eight zero five four five. That will get you to the uh, COVID hotline, and they can uh, set up an appointment for you. They can ask answer any of your questions, um, and they're happy to uh, find a spot for you to get uh, uh, a vaccine, whether it's the first dose, the second dose, or the booster. Oh, thanks so much, Dr. Fisher. All right. Jill, do we have time for another question? We have time for one last question. Um, Gary from Cedar Grove um, is asking about the tunnels. Gary, you are live. Hi. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. Uh, my, concern yeah, my, about the, yeah, my, my concern about the tunnel isn't that we're going to get another tunnel and get the other two fixed, but what happens in the Penn Station side? There's a lot of crowding. There's not enough platforms uh, for the people coming out. How is that going to be handled? I've been commuting for 38 years, and I experience this all the time. Sure. Uh, 
sure. I'm going to turn this over um, to Deputy Administrator Bose to talk a little bit about that. I'm not sure uh, that when you were last there, I actually um, was recently, I take the Acela down to Washington, D.C., and um, had not been into New York in a while, but ended up taking the Acela from New York City after an infrastructure meeting. And I was shocked that Moynihan Station is open. I took the Acela from Moynihan Station, um, which was beautiful. So I, I just, uh, I, I'm hoping that that helps to alleviate some of the platform. But uh, Deputy Administrator Bose, do you have some more information on that? Yes, yes, I do, uh, Congresswoman. So um, when I talked about the Gateway program, um, absolutely an important part of that is Penn Station expansion, uh, because like you just rightfully um, said and, and the uh, person asking the question brought up, yeah, when we do the new, when we build a new tunnel and when we rehab the existing one, uh, we've increased capacity. Where will those riders, um, those extra people go uh, when right now, as he correctly pointed out, sometimes uh, there's overcrowding um, at, at the current Penn Station. So Penn Station expansion is absolutely a part of it. Now, just because that hasn't started yet or the, the new tunnel construction um, will start before the Penn Station expansion doesn't mean that the Penn Station expansion portion won't catch up in, during the construction period. So the end result that we want to get to is that the new tunnel is completed, the old tunnel is rehabbed, and there is a new uh, Penn Station expansion to accommodate the uh, extra riders that we all are anticipating. Um, hope that helps. Uh, but but uh, there are definitely going to be um, steps um, to go through along the way. And just like we had the tunnel uh, come together with the project partners, we had the portal bridge come together uh, with uh, New Jersey Transit and Amtrak. Uh, for Penn Station expansion, we're going to need um, New Jersey Transit, Amtrak, uh, the Metropolitan Transportation Administration um, at, in New York City uh, and New York State uh, to be a part of that effort. Uh, but it's very much in our sights, and we absolutely understand that that's got to be uh, a part of this. Well, thanks so much. And that's about all the time we have for questions tonight, but I do want to thank again Dr. Fisher and Deputy Administrator Bose for joining us for the telephone town hall tonight. You both just really put out a lot of great information, so thank you again for taking the time, especially right on this holiday week, uh, getting a town hall in and the information out to everybody um, at all times, so I really do appreciate that. Uh, if we didn't get to your question tonight, my team and I are ready to help get to an answer. You can email my office at cheryl.house.gov slash contact or call our offices tomorrow. Our DC office number is 202-225-5034. That's 202-225-5034. And our district office here in New Jersey is 973-526-5668. That's 973-526-5668. My casework team has been monitoring the questions and will reach out to people as needed to see how we can help. You can also follow me on Facebook for the latest updates from my office. And I also have a newsletter with updates on my work in Washington, which you can sign up for at cheryl.house.gov. Thanks again for joining today. I hope everyone has an absolutely wonderful Thanksgiving. Stay safe and healthy, and please take care. Thanks so much for giving us the opportunity. Oh, thank you. Have a great Thanksgiving. You too.